Romans chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Praise God. We've been doing a little teaching on uh, aspects of the new covenant. <coughs> and um, so tonight we're going to try to fold this teaching into that because everything really does come from there. And everything that we need, praise God. From the work of, that Jesus has already accomplished for us when he died for us on Calvary. Because more than anything, than John and I were talking earlier, he gave us access to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. Amen. And there is nothing that the Holy Spirit cannot do. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So, Romans chapter 7, verse 22. Praise God. Here we go. It says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would fill me up with your Holy Spirit, oh Lord. I pray that you would use me as a vessel and that you would help me to communicate these truths that you have placed on my heart. And more than anything, I ask that your anointing, Lord, would be released into the hearts and lives and into the minds of your people, Lord, because we depend upon you for revelation, Lord. Lord God, you are the one that reveals. You are the one, Lord God, that you are the teacher. And so we depend on you tonight. We just give you thanks and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, teaching Romans chapter 7, in my opinion, is a little bit of a task. And we're just going to focus on these two verses. I love I love Romans 7, but it, but it is something that a lot of times preachers sometimes steer away from because because there's a lot of complicated wording in it and to try to, to get to the heart of it. But we're going to just take some little bite-sized pieces on it. So, you know, first of all, the word law was used in here four times. It's from what I can see. Count real quick. Uh, the word law was used to talk about the law of God. And then it talked about, but I see another law in my members. And then it was at war with the law in my mind, and which would bring him into captivity of the law of sin. Let me just say a couple of things about this passage, uh, this chapter, actually. In the book of Romans, um, what we understand is this, is that the, the Apostle Paul, when he begins to explain to us Romans chapter 6, what we learn in Romans 6 is this, is that whenever we understand what Jesus did for us, when we put faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross, in the mind of God, the old man that was born of Adam was placed into Christ. We use the word, the word baptized is the translation, but I've tried to explain that before. We're not going to get into the nuts and bolts of it, but the word baptism there is not describing water. Is describing an immersion that took place through the Holy Spirit. That's, you're, we're not saved through water. We're saved through faith in Christ and what he did. Now, water and water baptism is a very powerful thing. It's a very, but what it, what it actually describes, though, is the work that has already taken place. You don't want to ever limit God because God can do mighty and powerful things. And he's done mighty and powerful things through water baptism. But a person that gets baptized is professing that they've already been saved. They're professing that they've been born again already and that the water now is the sealing of it. And what we're saying is, I was, I died in Christ going into the water. I've been buried in Christ. Amen. And I'm coming back now. I'm not trying to say, look, it really in the New Testament, but especially when Philip ran up on the Ethiopian, uh, the, the eunuch of Candace, basically the, 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 the Ethiopian eunuch, he got baptized immediately upon believing in Jesus. And, um, and that's probably the way it ought to be, to be honest with you. But nowadays in the modern church, you know, uh, it doesn't usually go that way. But anyway, so what I want you to know is this, is that in, in Romans chapter 6, when we place faith in Christ, that the old man that we were, that was born in Adam, that was bound by sin, that where sin had power and dominion over our lives. Anybody ever been there before? Yeah. Uh, so, so, but that, that guy that was born first in Adam died. And he was buried and a new creation has been resurrected, amen, to newness of life. So now, though, what we learn in Romans 7 is this, is that before Paul, now you, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the commentary real quick because we're not going to go all the way backwards tonight. But before Paul understood Romans 6, Romans 7 is 
where he was living, but, I, but it was after he was a believer, all right? And some people, that's where they get a little bit confused. They think that Paul wasn't a believer yet. And if you read behind some Baptist scholars, that's the position that they take also. But whenever the Apostle Paul explains in the early part of the, of the chapter, I'm just going to say this. He said, I was alive once without the law, but then sin revived and I died. And he said, then the commandment came, sin revived and I died. I was alive once without the law. The commandment came, sin revived. And I died. Now, the, the word revived is only used two times in the Greek New Testament. They're both in the book of Romans. The word explicitly describes something that was dead and came back to life. There's no way that sin can be dead in a human being's life other than through their association with Jesus and what he did for them at the cross. Because I'm telling you, like one of my favorite preachers used to give this little illustration where you can put two... 15 month olds in the same crib, give them one rubber ducky and back up and you can watch the show because what's gonna happen is you're gonna see their sinful nature come out because selfishness will rule. You don't have to teach that to a human being. It's in them. You have to teach them the opposite. And uh, that's just one illustration to describe. So, but the idea is, is this, is that whenever we attempt to approach God, now this is some, some important information, I believe, really the kind of information that helped set me free from the bondage of sin, even though I was a Christian for 12 years. Even though I was a Christian for 12 years, going to church, still bound by lust, still bound by alcohol, hiding it real good, but not really free. Periods and seasons where I was free, uh, where I, but it was really more like willpower. I'm just going to be real with you. Most of my Christian walk was willpower and kind of like an AA meeting. All right. And that's not the way Christianity is supposed to be. Right. The scripture says that we're more than conquerors through Christ yes, who loved yes, us and gave himself for us. We are supposed to be walking in victory, not failure. And, and Jesus paid a high price so that we could have victory. Amen. And the reality of it is, is that at least whenever I was saved back in the 80s, there was a very prominent works based message that was going on. Now, whether people realize it or not, when you begin to put your faith in works, not to get saved saved. Nobody's going to try to work. Most Christians that you talk to won't try to work their way to heaven as far as salvation. Most Christians you talk to will understand the concept that in order to be saved, you have to put your faith in Jesus and what he did for you at the cross. Most people believe that, right? Because it was his sacrifice that died for us. Maybe when we got saved, we didn't even know it, but we knew something. We felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We knew we needed help. We called on the name of Jesus. And really and truly, our life has probably never really been the same since that moment that we really got saved. I think everybody would agree with that. Amen. Um, and so, so when that happened, that's what happened is according to Romans six at that moment, what, what happened was your old man in the mind of God died with Jesus. And then I keep saying it like this, and I don't mean to be overly redundant, but it's like the Holy spirit or the father hit a rewind button and went back 2000 years. And he sees you now in, in Christ on the cross, dying with him, being buried with him, and literally a new creation being resurrected to newness of life. That's how God sees you. That's why he says in Romans 6 verse 11, he said, reckon yourself therefore to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive in Christ. He wants us to reckon ourselves or to begin to see ourselves the way that he sees us. He sees us as our old man being dead and a new man being resurrected to newness of life. A couple of weeks ago, we had a little Bible study on a Sunday night, and the topic or the verse that we used was Colossians 2 6. And this Colossians 2 6 says this the same way you received him, so shall you continue to walk in him. Now, most people would agree, well, I just said it, that the way that you had to receive Jesus was through faith. And you have to put faith. See, if somebody's not repenting of sin and they're not putting faith in Jesus and within his sacrifice, they're, made, they're really not saved. Amen. Because you have to put your faith in, in what Jesus did on the cross and you have to repent of your sin in order for true salvation to take place. And so whenever we get saved, though, the scripture says this, that the same way we got saved is the same way we stay in him. What does that mean? We stay in him through faith. Faith in what? 
faith in what he did for us at the cross. Why? Because that is the new covenant. Yes. You got to understand, faith in what Jesus did is what releases the power of the Holy Spirit to flow in your life. I'm not talking about when you show up at some service where there's, you know, thousands of people and everybody's worshiping the Lord and you feel the manifest presence of God. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when you're driving home by yourself. I'm talking about when you're all by yourself and that the enemy has been having his way in your life and you don't know how to get free. I'm talking about at those moments and in those times, what I'm trying to explain to you is this, is that the same way you received him is the same way you walk in him through faith in what he did. And you believe in that and you hold on to that because you know, according to the word of God, that what Jesus did allowed the Holy Spirit to move on the inside of your heart because now you, it's no longer a system <coughs> of animal sacrifices. Because the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin, but instead it was the sin of the eternal lamb. And that when he laid down his life, when he rose from the dead, when he ascended into heaven, the Bible says now he is seated at the right hand of the father because there's no more work for him to do. Yes, there's no more. But oh, those other priests, according to the letter to the Hebrews, there was a reminder every year. Every year, all day long, as each sacrifice was given, but when Jesus gave his sacrifice, he said, it is finished. The work was complete, and now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Now, we're not going to go there, but, but if we did, we could go to Galatians chapter 2, and verse, 20, and verse 21, where it says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but he liveth in me. And now this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Then he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now, what I want you to know is this, is that when we say that when the commandment came, sin revived. And when we say that the law can frustrate grace, you may not understand this. And this may be new to you, but you can actually put your faith in rules that you make up and you can begin to put your faith in that. Now, when I first got saved, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I love, I'm so grateful that I got saved. I'm so grateful that I went to the church that I went to and that I heard the gospel preached. But one of the first things that was told to me was this, is that now that you're saved, you have some things that you have to do. And that is absolutely true. True born again believers you need to get in the word of God. Amen. You need to spend time in the presence of God. It's, it's imperative that we learn how to pray. It's, it's imperative that we spend time in, in God's presence. Amen. And, now, and all those things should lead us back to Jesus. Amen. But the next thing you know, you know, it was all these different laws and rules and regulations. It was like, you know, you can't go see PG-13. And I, now I've learned the hard way that they were right, by the way. <laughs> you shouldn't go see PG-13. But this is what I'm trying to say. It has to be a work of the Spirit. You can't tell someone how to dress. You can't tell someone what to watch. If you try through, through these rules and regulations... To him, now you're living like the Old Testament law. Yes. In reality, what, what the beauty of the new covenant is, is that when you, he died, you died with him. And that now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. And he's speaking to you. And he will convict you. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the name of the movie, but Danielle and I went and, and, and had our... Now, I thought it was a Christian movie. Just because of the the name, like when I read the little thing, I wouldn't just go see any movie. I'm just now you go see what you want. And it's not that I haven't seen movies as a Christian or a pastor. I've seen too many movies as a Christian or a pastor. I'm being honest with you, but I just don't do. I don't go see movies right now unless it's like a Christian type or you know one of those kinds of movies. Anyway, that's enough of that. I thought it was. It didn't take me but about three to five minutes. Not because of language, but because of how they were. And I was like, dude, you need to lick this. I mean, I didn't call her dude. I said, this something's not right with this. It doesn't feel right. And uh, anyway, long story short, she looked it up. And when I saw the producer, I'm like, we're out. <laughs> you know, we're out. So the Holy, So what I'm trying to say is this. But there's been times that I've been in movies before. And the Holy Spirit was dealing with me. But my flesh wanted to finish watching what was there. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And listen, we got to be careful with that. Because then we'll quench the, the Holy Spirit. But, but when you're trying in your own flesh, that's like law. 
That's like you in your own strength trying to please God by trying to make yourself holy because somebody else gave you certain laws and rules and principles to operate by. And I'm trying to tell you this is that I'm just trying to help people be led to Jesus. And I'm trying to explain to people to let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you because he's going to call you to a much higher standard through grace than the law ever was. Yes, yes. Grace calls you to a higher standard than the law. The, the law said don't kill a man. Jesus said that if you have anger in your heart like that, that you've already done it. Yes. Jesus, the law said that you don't commit adultery and you'll get stoned. Jesus said if you lust out the woman in your heart, you've already done it. Yes. And then I know I know what you're saying because I used to think it. Oh, he didn't really mean that. Yes. He can't mean that. What you talking about? He didn't mean it. You think he didn't mean it because you, your mind's been full of it. And you're full of the lies. And you don't know how to get free from it. I'm not talking to y'all because I don't really know what's in your mind. I'm telling you what happened to me. Surely he didn't mean that because I hadn't been free from lust but for about two weeks when I first got saved. Because I started to immediately go into a system of works-based Christianity. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that when we conceive without realizing it, we will put our faith in what we think we're supposed to do. And this is real simple right here. We will put our faith in what we think we're supposed to do instead of putting our faith in what he already did. Yes, yes. So when he died, he broke the power of sin. That's the scripture. We're not going to go to it, but Colossians 2, 14 and 15, he already broke the power of sin. He broke, he broke the principalities and powers. He defeated the works of darkness when he died on the cross. We looked at that verse a, a week or so ago. And so now we're talking about laws, but we're talking about spiritual laws. He's not, these four laws we mentioned are not the Ten Commandments. And you know, laws have jurisdiction over people. If you live in a certain realm and they have certain laws, they have jurisdiction. I've told y'all before, I, I turned 10 in Singapore. And I just remember my mom explaining to me, you know, no, there's no, it was just starting, I believe, at that time, where there was a big deal about chewing gum. And now they've even passed laws. Like if you import gum into Singapore, you get like a $2,000 fine and you can go to prison. And because, because first of all, they, you know, they, whatever the case. But the point, then over there, some, some American boy got caught spraying graffiti on the wall. They came in. They took a bamboo cane, laid him on his belly, and took, and took his pants off and, and whooped the back of his thighs multiple, multiple times. They have different laws over there. It didn't matter he was an American citizen. He was living over there. He had to live under their laws. Laws have jurisdiction wherever we live. These are spiritual laws. Yes. And so what we need to understand is, is that when we live our lives for the Lord and we're our, the object of our faith is right and the Holy Spirit's flowing in our life, then now we're engaging certain laws and I'm going to show it to you here after a while. And, but when we're not, we engage other laws. And these other laws frustrate the grace of God. These other laws allow sin to regain power in the life of the believer. And that's not supposed to be normal Christianity. Okay, so I want you to understand that. So, listen, I don't want anybody to raise their hand. I don't want you to shake your head yes. But if you might be a Christian, and almost since you got saved, or you've been struggling in your walk with God, and sometimes you thought you wanted to quit, because you didn't know how to access, you didn't know, you didn't think, you, you just got tired of failing God. I'm going to tell you right now, a couple of months after my sister died, I called up my mom and I said, I quit. I'm just going to be real with you. I love the Lord. She can tell you I love the Lord. I, I, I did all the things you were supposed to do, but I was sick and tired of cheating on the Lord. And I said, I quit. And I thank God that that was the night. <laughs> And he showed up <laughs> and he spoke to me. Amen. Whenever we get desperate, see, sometimes people feel like, man, I'm so desperate. I'm in such a bad spot. No, you're not. You're in the best spot you could ever yes. be. You just got to hear the truth and bow to Amen. it. You just got to surrender to it. Amen. So yeah, these, so these laws carry weight and authority. Amen. And this is one of the things that stuck out to me though. If you can put that back up there, maybe in uh, verse 23. Uh, specifically when he said this he said but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind 
So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, but before we do, let me just say a couple of things. He did mention the law of sin, right? He said, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Now, I want you to know that I, this is how I believe I'm, I'm preaching tonight. Maybe it's possible when John gets his chance to preach, he might preach it a little different. Aaron might say it a little bit different. But this is my take on it right here, that that the, the law in my, the law of sin, we're talking about the sinful nature, okay? We're talking about the sinful nature that we receive from our father Adam, right? It's, it's written, if you will, I use this loosely, but it's written on our spiritual DNA, okay? Um, in essence, when we're talking about the sinful nature, we can also describe it like this, the source of sin, the factory of sin, the power of sin, Sometimes I say this, the noun of sin. Yes, yes. Why are you saying it like that, preacher? Because in the Greek language, it's a noun. That's different than a verb. That's right. People get so caught up in the verbs of sin. They look at their lust problem. They look at their alcohol problem. They look at their drug problem. They look at their fear problem. They look at their anger problem. They look at their whatever problem. But what they don't understand is there's a power behind yes. sin that's producing it yes. like a factory. Right. So when you look at sin in Romans 6 and 7, almost every time it's being used as a noun, it's not describing a verb. And what's happening is because the sinful nature is awakened and not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be dormant. It's almost like it's supposed to be a situation where... Um, well, let's, let's go ahead and do it like this, maybe. What's going to happen if I do that? I turned off that light. I turned off, turned off some lights. I flipped the switch. It, whenever, whenever sin is not handled properly, then it's like the cord's plugged in and the switch is on and the energy or the power of sin is flowing and it's producing results. But whenever the faith is right in what Jesus has done, the grace of the Holy Spirit is moving and now the switch is off and the power of sin is not flowing and having its way in the life of the believer. That's the way the relationship of sin is supposed to be. It's supposed to be lying dormant. It's not supposed to be flared up. It's not supposed to be the boss. Jesus is the boss. Yes. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. He's our master. Sin is not our master. Amen. And that's what the scripture says. All right. So what is sin? I mean, sin is really the definition is to miss the mark. It's like if the Lord says that the bullseye back there is this and you missed it, then you missed it. Because you can say you don't see PG-13 and go see a PG movie because you made a law that said you could see PG and you didn't cross the line. But then you get in a PG movie and I don't know, they got something in there that's not right. And the Holy Spirit starts convicting you and you don't even, you're like, no, I'm good because this is PG. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you and he wants to have a personal relationship with you. And he wants to, he wants to speak and he wants us to listen. Amen. So, so I wanted you to see Romans 14 and 23 real quick. Uh, just more so, listen, what Romans 14, the whole chapter is talking about eating certain foods. And this guy can eat food and he doesn't feel convicted. Another guy eats food and he feels convicted. Feast days, this one keeps a feast day, that one doesn't. And, you know, but, but really what it's talking about is conviction. And he says, if he eat, if he that doubts is damned. In other words, if he eats, he's bringing judgment on himself. Why? Because he's eating not of faith. That means that he's feeling, he's feeling like something's not right. And he's not, and so therefore he shouldn't eat. <laughs> okay? Like if you're feeling conviction, you shouldn't eat. Okay? And if he does, then now he's just damning himself because he's doing it or he's bringing judgment on himself because he's doing something that the Holy Spirit's not telling him to do. Somebody else that doesn't feel conviction over eating the food, now you got to be careful with that. Because I'm going to tell you right now, people will take wine and they'll throw wine into that basket. And, and all I'm going to tell you is this. You start off with one glass of wine and the next thing you know, you drink two glasses of wine, three glasses of wine, and you start to get a buzz. I'm telling you right now, you done broke, you done broke the rule because the word of God says that, that drunkenness is a sin. 
and you're not supposed to get drunk. So I'm not trying to tell you that, but I felt like I needed to throw that in there. Okay, so, but this is, what, this is really what I wanted you to see. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Anything that we're operating in that's not of faith is sin. That means if we're having unbelief in an area, and, and the reason I'm trying to make that point is that we all still fall short in areas of our life and we need to recognize that and we need to be able to, when we do, that we bring it to the Lord. Amen. We have an advocate with the Father, His Son, the Lord Jesus, and He's going to heal us of it and He's going to give us the strength and the power that we need in order for it to be right. So whatever is not a faith is sin. In James 4, 17, you know, you don't have to go there. I'll just read it real quick. Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So it's important for us to consider these passages because sin's not always what we want it to be. And what I mean by that is this, is that sometimes we can pick sins that we don't struggle with, but we know that other people struggle with. Right. And, and then we kind of look down on people and it kind of helps us to elevate ourselves. I know y'all don't do that kind of things, but there's been times in my life that I've done that. And I'll be honest with you, I'm ashamed to admit that. I had a conversation with somebody today and I was telling them, man, there was a time whenever I was I was so free. I felt like I was so free from lust. And, and when I'd have conversations with men, I'm not going to say exactly what I would say. But I would just, I would, I would kind of go off on, you know, to, and I was talking, telling them the truth about the message. But then I would say, and, and you know what else? That's a sin too. And when I'd say it, uh, you know, I knew it was piercing. I, because I just, I knew that they were probably struggling with it. And, you know, the Lord has a way of dealing with our hearts because I realize now I was really operating in pride. And, and that, and that but, but what I want you to know is this, is that there is freedom from the struggles that we face. There's even freedom in our mind. I want you yes. to know that. Yeah. And that's really where I'm kind of getting at is the mind yeah. before it's over with tonight. I want to share that with you. But I want you to know that even in our thoughts, the Holy Spirit right. can take over. Yeah. And he will begin to cleanse our thinking. And he will begin to give us victory in our minds. And that's yeah. a beautiful thing. Because yes. most of the time, people are tormented in their minds. Amen? Amen? Because we conveniently choose the stuff that others struggle with, but we don't. And in our minds, it protects our spirituality and kind of gives us a little bit of an elevated position. So some of these sinful things that we might struggle with and not consider sinful I'm just, I just put a quick list here just because it's things we don't typically talk about. Submission to authority, you know? Like, I don't know about you, but I had a major problem with authority. And I've told y'all some of those stories before, and I think I'm getting better at it by the grace of God. I have learned by the grace of God to take correction. Um, I believe now I'm just, you know... Take it easy on me if you're going to correct me because I'm going to try to take it easy on you if I'm not you. But I'm just telling you, like a lot of times people really do have a problem with submitting to authority and receiving any kind of correction. Living in fear. You know, sometimes we, we, we find ourselves bound by fear. It's not God's will for us to be bound by fear. That's sin because it's, a lot, it's, a, it's, it's describing unbelief. Watching unclean things. We talked a little bit about that. Manipulation. You know, sometimes we're over here trying to get people to do things and we try to offer them things to get them to do things. And that's manipulation. And that's not the Holy Spirit. People have to be have the opportunity to be able to, 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 be able to do what they feel like they're led by the Spirit. Now, this is the thing. Many times I've learned that it's not always the best decisions that they're making. And if they ask my opinion, I'll try to explain to them what I think. But it's not my job to try to coerce someone to do what I think they should do. That's not, that's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, an unteachable know-it-all spirit. I don't know if you've ever been around people like that, but I'm, I'm familiar with that one too because I've had it in my life. I didn't realize it. I thought it was teachable. But to be honest with you, I realize now looking backwards, there's been times in my life I just thought I knew everything. And, and I see that a lot of people. Now, I am grateful now that I've learned that through discernment, I can pick it up pretty quick, you know, and, and now I don't feel like I have to keep forging forward. Once I, once I, once I engage that spirit, 
or that whatever you want to call it that's coming off of that person, that unteachable spirit, I don't feel like I have to keep going. And the Lord's freed me from that, you know, because the Lord reminded me. Now what I got to do is, and I'm getting better at this too, when I used to, when I used to sense it in them, I would say, yeah, you know, sometimes whenever you're talking to people about the Lord, you can kind of tell that they don't want to hear what you're saying. And the Lord said, don't cash a pearl before swine. And, you know, now I would never say it in a way that they knew that I was saying it to them. But at the same time, they knew that it was being said to them because they knew what they were feeling and I could feel it too. And so now, by the grace of God, I don't do that anymore because that's just not necessary and it's not nice. But that's what happens. People that have an unteachable spirit, you're trying to talk to them about the things of God. You can feel it coming off of them. They know it all. And you're just wasting your time. Amen. There's somebody else down the road that needs to hear the good news of the gospel. And it's time just to get up and just to just to move on and to bring it where where they know what to do with a pearl, the pearl of great price. Amen. All right. So he said this. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the battle in the mind, the law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I want to give us some ideas to think about. Now, listen, I don't need you to agree with everything I'm saying. I'm really trying to provoke thought. I'm really trying to get people to stimulate our spiritual minds and to think about some of these concepts, okay? So if you don't agree with me completely, it's okay. Uh, but the law of sin is the sinful nature, right? When I connect that to my members, now I have at least one aspect of the meaning of the word flesh. While it's true that the word for sin is hamartia and the word for flesh is sarx, they, there is a connection between the two. Now, I'm not trying to get all fancy on you. I'm just trying to give you a, an explanation, okay? So this is the word har, hamartia, and this is the word sarx right here. Okay, sarx is how you spell it in, in, in in, in Greek, okay? And so this is sin. Now this can be either a verb or a noun, depending upon what, what's going on. And then this is the word for flesh, okay? And I just wanted you to see that there are two different words, but I want to make, I want to define for you some of the meanings of the word flesh. Uh, we were having some conversations about this the other day. It could be the meat of an animal, okay? Like as in food, flesh. It could be the body as opposed to to the soul or the spirit. This comes right out of the, the uh, Strong's Greek dictionary, okay? So it could be the body as opposed to the soul or the spirit, meaning that which is outside, right? And it can also describe your flesh, like your family, right? But this is where we're getting a little closer. Human nature with its frailties, physically, morally, and its passions. Now, let me just ask a question. I just want to stimulate a little thought. Why is human nature frail? Sin, right? Human nature wouldn't have necessarily been frail whenever they were created in the image and likeness of God. Why does human nature have passions that are against the will of God? Because of sin. So already, before digging too deep, we already know that to some extent, flesh has a connection to the sinful nature, at least in our first birth, which was in Adam. And this is the last one I want you to see. Carnally minded. Carnally minded is connected to the word flesh. All right, so the two I wanna focus on real quick though is the body as opposed to the soul and the spirit and also the carnal mind. Both of these can be labeled as the flesh. So with that said, it's important for us to know that the soul is not completely disconnected from the flesh because the mind is part of the soul. The mind, the will, and the soul. It's also not completely disconnected from the spirit. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to save that little part of the board over there. But some of y'all are already familiar with some of this teaching because I, I did an extensive teaching on the soul versus the spirit versus the body. So we're going to say this is the Holy Spirit and this is your spirit. Okay. HS stands for Holy Spirit. YS stands for your spirit. And then this is the soul right here. We're going to call this the soul. And the soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. All right? 
And then this is your body. Sometimes the word body, so it can be your flesh physically. And then we're not talking about sin because Jesus was born in the flesh and he had no sin. Right. But but whenever we're talking about the flesh in, in like the book of Romans, we're talking about that there is a connection between your flesh and, and sin that works in your members. OK. And so what so th so this is your body. It can be also called your members. Your, because you know what did the word of God say? Don't use your the mem your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Use your mem members as instruments of righteousness. So your body parts are not to be utilized for the things of darkness. Your body parts as a man of God or a woman of God are to be utilized for the kingdom of God. Does that make sense? Amen. And so one of the things that I want you to know, though, is this, is that where God really wants to meet with us, well, where, where God does meet with us is in this spot right here. The, the script, we've been talking about the scripture a lot, but 1 Corinthians 6 and 17, I believe it is. You can put that up there real quick. 1 Corinthians 6 and 17 says that, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit moves into your spirit. Listen, he's, okay, so you got that scripture. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 36, and let's start at verse 25. And I'm just going to go ahead and talk to you about this a little bit. We've already talked about this last week a little bit. We used some of these scriptures, but we didn't dig that deep. So we're going to dig a little bit deeper on the scripture right here. So when it says right here, then I will sprinkle <laughs> clean water upon you. Now, one of the first things I want to talk to you about is that there's the possibility that somebody might say, um, you know, oh, there you go. Water baptism, right? I mean, it's possible. Now, I struggled with this scripture when I first got saved and people were first talking to me about the new covenant because I had a problem. Why does it say water? How am I going to sit here and talk to someone about this new covenant and all the focus being on the blood? And here is this outlier in the Old Testament that has this word water right here. And he says he's going to cleanse me. And he's going to make me clean from all my filthiness when he sprinkles water on me. Right? Well, hallelujah. One day as I was studying and digging deeper, I, the Lord helped me figure it out. Because he's talking about the ashes of the red heifer. And the beauty about the ashes of the red heifer is the way they handled that sacrifice was different than all the other ones. All the other ones, they laid their hand on that animal, transferred their guilt to it, cut its throat, and bled that animal. In this sacrifice right here, they didn't bleed the animal. They burnt the whole thing, blood and all. In the book of Leviticus, it specifically says, burn the whole carcass with the blood contained within it. Then they take those ashes and they would use a pinch of the ashes in the waters of cleansing. And Moses said everything in the Old Testament was sprinkled with blood to cleanse it because the blood <clears throat> was contained in the ashes. So I just wanted to point that out to you. That's actually what the new covenant is built on is the blood of Jesus. All right. So let's go to the next verse. He says this. Uh, and a new heart will I give you. So when you get converted in the new covenant, the scripture says he's giving you a new heart. Amen. And he puts a new spirit within you. See, the Holy Spirit moves in and he renews our spirit. And he's going to take away our stony heart out of our flesh. And then he gives us a heart of flesh, which is a heart that he can minister to. It's, he, he makes it pliable to where he can conform it. Amen. Into his image. All right. And so let's, let's go to the next verse. And then he says this. And then look at this. I will put my spirit within you. So this is the prophet Ezekiel. So we're looking at somewhere around BC 586 to 500 and, you know, four, to, to 400, somewhere in that time frame before Jesus, 400 to 500 years before Jesus. And this is what he says. And the Lord's going to put his spirit in you and he's going to cause you to walk according to his statutes and keep his judgment. So the Holy Spirit prophesied. That about the new covenant, that when the new covenant comes, it was going to change everything because the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin, but the blood of Jesus removed sin and allowed the Holy Spirit to move on the inside of the vessel. Amen. And so what I want you to see is this, is that this is where you're saved. This is where you're saved, right? I mean, your soul is saved, but listen, I'm not trying to get too technical because I want to do some more teaching on this as time moves forward. But look. 
I want you to understand your soul is who you are. You are a spirit. Okay, I'm not, let's just, just bear with me for a second. You are a spirit. God is spirit. And, he's, and, and those that are going to worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You are a spirit. God is a spirit. Angels are spirits. Demons are spirits. Angels don't have, have never had a terrestrial body. I believe demons have had a terrestrial body. They, they because of, when they died, their spirits were released. That's why they're looking for a body to live in. That's another story for another time. God doesn't have a, 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 a physical body other than when he was incarnated in Jesus. Amen. That I know. Of. I mean, he showed up in the Old Testament. You get the point. Okay. But you were created specifically. By God, as a spirit being with a terrestrial or earthly body, and we don't know what we're going to look like, but we know that when we see him, we will be as he is, yes, yes. and we're going to receive a glorified body, Amen. and Jesus walked through walls, hallelujah, but he still ate fish, and I don't, I'm just excited to know that we're going to get an upgrade, my friend, but I want you, so I want you to know, though, is that you are a spirit, that's the eternal part of of who you are. Don't believe the Jehovah's Witnesses and they come knocking on your door. There's no such thing as soul sleep. No. You're, when you, when you, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and you're either going to be with the Lord, okay, or you're going to be in hell. One or the other. Torment. And that's the way that it goes. You either put your faith in Christ or you didn't put your faith in Christ and Lord help us. Okay, and so, but they say you soul sleep. No, you're an eternal creature. And listen, because you're a soul, you're an individual. You have a name. Okay, you have a name. Matt is going to know what's going on. He's gonna, he, Matt's going to know where he is, and he's going to know, and I hope that this provokes you. I hope that this provokes you to make you want to tell somebody about Jesus tomorrow. Because listen, the people that go to hell, are going to know. They're going to remember. I believe that. They're individuals with personalities. They have names. They live their life. They're going to have memories. They are going to remember that every time that you talk to them about the Lord, they're going to remember every time somebody talked to them about the Lord, they're going to remember. Okay? So you're a spirit. You have, you, you have a soul. That's your identity, who you are, and you're encased in a physical body. Okay? Does that make sense? I went into that a little bit more than I wanted to. But I did want you to know this, though, is that your soul is not saved. I mean, yes, your soul is saved. That's not what I wanted to say. But your soul is not sanctified. Okay, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, I believe it is. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23. Your soul is saved, but it's not sanctified. Yeah, yeah, there's there's good. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That means the whole thing. Okay, because if it was talking about holy, like holy like God, Hagios, it wouldn't have a W before. Okay, so the God of peace sanctify you, the whole thing. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what you need to understand is this. Even though the scripture says you have a mind of Christ, the scripture also says that your mind must be renewed. Your mind is the place where the enemy comes to attack. Your mind is the battlefield where the enemy comes to cause confusion, to cause doubt, to cause unbelief. And if your mind is not renewed based upon the truth of the scripture, you're just going to believe whatever any preacher tells you, whatever any other believer tells you, but if your mind is renewed to the truth of the scripture, you will know what to believe. You will know how to keep your faith anchored in what Jesus did for you. Amen? Amen. So I just wanted you to know the soul is not completely disconnected from the spirit. Okay? Now we do know this. The word can separate them, right? As a matter of fact, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 real quick. Just so you can see it, I didn't plan on going there, but I'm going to. Hebrews 4 and 12 says this. Um, for the word of God is quick, that's King James for uh, alive, and powerful, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. 
it pierces even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let's just slow that down a little bit. So why did he use joints and marrow as an illustration? Because the, the marrow is on the inside of the bone and the joint is part of the bone. And those two things are actually very interconnected one to the other. And it's not separated very easily. You understand what I'm saying? You need a surgeon's knife or a saw or something to get to work to separate those things, right? And so he's wanting us to know that the soul and the spirit are also very closely connected. As a matter of fact, the soul and the spirit make up the inner man, but they're not exactly the same thing. I used to like the way Brother Larson used to say, he would say this, is that, that the soul and the spirit together are a wheel. You can't have a tire without a rim and still have a wheel, and you can't have a rim without a tire and still have a wheel. They're one, but they're not. You can take a tire off of a rim, and you can separate the soul from the spirit. And the spirit is where the Holy Spirit lives, but your soul is partly to do with your mind. And if your mind is not renewed according to the scripture, and you start to believe a lie, and you let the enemy come in, now the enemy will start to affect your will. See, that's what he wants to get a hold of. He wants to get a hold of your mind so that he can now begin to divert you according to his will rather than the Father's will. And once you start to walk according to the enemy's will instead of the Lord's will, now what happens? Come on. Next thing you know, you're going to want to go see a counselor. Next thing you know, you're going to want to get on medicine. Say, help somebody help me. Because you know I'm telling you the truth. If our emotions, so then it starts to affect our emotions. And in reality, we're the Lord, if we would stay focused on the Lord, keep our hope in him, believe in him, trust in him, he would begin. Now, listen, I'm not saying that there's never a time or a place for things. That's not what I'm getting at. But that is not the answer. The ultimate answer is not those other things. The ultimate answer is Jesus. All right. So flesh is used to describe a carnal mind. I want, to look, I want to look at a couple of scriptures with you, and then I'm going to have to close. I didn't even get halfway through my notes, but it's okay. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. So it says this. It says the natural man. So in that, in that passage of scripture, in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the natural man would be, I'm just going to spell it like it would look in English, Okay. It's a variant of this word right here. So this word in English would actually look like this, sarks, okay? And this, and this word natural is in the Greek, sarkikos. So how would, what would we call that? Let's call it flesh. So the natural man is flesh, right? And, and, he, and he says this, it says, but the, and so the natural man could not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So, when, so you can be a Christian. This is important. This is really one of the main things I wanted to get across to you. You can be a Christian and not be spiritually minded. Yes. You can be a Christian and be carnally minded. You understand? You're not, because you're not thinking according to the way of the Spirit. You don't understand the new covenant. I'm, I'm not saying you don't. You get what I'm trying to say. Christians can be in a position where they don't understand the new covenant. They don't know how to submit to the new covenant. They don't understand that putting faith in Christ and what he did is what releases the Holy Spirit. And now they're carnal. And that's one way to be carnal. They're carnal and they're putting their faith in what they do instead of what Jesus did. Or you, and when that happens, then you open up doors because you frustrate the grace of God and the next thing you know all kind of trouble starting to happen and now you start to get carnal because you're operating and you're trying to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Alright, but it starts here. <laughs> because, because if you mortify through the Spirit your members, the book of Colossians. What does that mean? Put to death. When you do the work of the mortician on your members... The Holy, when you get permission of the Holy Spirit by putting faith in Christ and what he did, the Holy Spirit puts to death those members that are trying to go after something sinful. All right, so I just want you to know that a Christian can be carnally minded. Look, look, let's go to 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 and I'll show you what I'm talking about real quick. <coughs> 
He said, brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. So there we go. There's the fleshly. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't tell you the truth. I messed you up. Sorry about that. This word is not sarkikos right here. Sorry. Here we go. This word is sarkikos. Soulish. That's the word for suke. It's where, where we get the word, the word in the Greek for, for soul would be spelled like that, suke. So the natural man is operating in his soulish world. And that means that his mind, can, can, his mind, again, can be carnal, right? And the word carnal is sarkikos, okay? And then in the word spiritual, the word is pneumatical. <coughs> okay, what is the big deal? Pneuma, it means wind, it means air. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. So, so the Christian can be, he could not speak to you as though you were spiritual, okay, but as unto carnal. So I couldn't talk to you in a spiritual way because you weren't, you weren't spiritual. You see, that's the difference between the spirit is pneuma, spiritual is pneumatikos. A spiritual person is operating in the spirit. His faith is properly placed in the Lord. His faith is properly placed in the new covenant. He understands that he can't do it on his own. He understands that he's dependent upon the Lord. He cries out to the Lord. He surrenders. He says that what Jesus did was enough. He holds on to that. He believes in that. No matter what somebody else comes around and tries to tell him, whatever the newest groovy yes, fad yes. is in the church, no, he, he, he shuns that. He holds on to what the scriptures say, and now he becomes spiritually minded, and now the Holy Spirit begins to move on the inside of his heart and in his life. Amen. Yeah. And a lot more scriptures. Maybe we'll just save them for next week. Praise God. We'll get uh, maybe Yvette can come play us a song and we can close out, praise God, with a song and worship the Lord. So that was the main thing I wanted to get across to you is that the battlefield is in the mind and that as a Christian, we can still be carnally minded and not spiritually minded and that uh, but but it doesn't have to stay that way we can pray to the Lord and we can ask him to reveal to us a heart of the spirit amen and uh, and allow the Lord to have that way and work in his in our lives